Well, thank you, uh, Claire and Stefan, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming. And I'll continue on the topic of uh, long non-coding RNAs, uh, almost completely unrelated to, to cancer, but uh, I hope we'll get some general concepts about our work. And uh, what we're trying to do is to understand generally what can a long RNA do in a mammalian cell. And understanding that is important both for uh, eventually interpreting whole genome sequences or, whole, uh, or, 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 or cancer genomes, which are now becoming readily available. And in these genomes today, we can interpret quite well variation which happens in the coding sequence, because we understand the genetic code, because we know what kind of mutations are going to be deleterious and what kind of mutations are probably not going to do much. But when we go to this so-called dark genome or dark space, and in particular into sequences which we know are transcribed into these long RNA molecules, we don't have today a genetic code at hand. So we don't really uh, have any ability or a very limited ability to predict which variation is actually important or potentially can be sort of functionally relevant and is worth going after. So this is largely sort of our, our goal in life, which we don't anticipate to uh, solve in the next uh, few years, but we do hope to solve within a couple of decades. And uh, so I'll give a relatively short introduction. We had to get a great introduction from uh, about um, no code transcription. I think one way that it's useful to think about link RNAs is contrasting them with classical non coding RNAs. And classical non coding RNAs, such as tRNAs, uh, microRNAs are classical at this point, SNOR RNAs, ribosomal RNA, of course. So, what are the key differences? So, both of the classical encoding RNAs are typically produced by specialized RNA polymerases, whereas the typical link RNA is produced by RNA polymerase II, and as a result, it's typically going to be capped, spliced, and mostly polyadenylated. As a result, also, because they're produced by uh, RNA pol II, they, similarly to a typical mRNA, they're expressed at relatively low levels. And still, they're about an order of magnitude lower than a typical mRNA, so many link RNAs when are expressed in cells are only found at one to five copies, and sometimes at less than one copy per cell. In contrast to classical non-coding RNAs, which can be divided into families, in many cases based on their structures or specific sequences, and within these families are functioning in some uniform way for specific biochemical pathways, for link RNAs, we'd like to think that there are also families out there. This is a very attractive model. It's very important for us because then we can transfer information from one link RNA to others. But if we look honestly at the literature, we don't see a lot of evidence so far of such families which have been discovered. So we're looking for these families, but so far most link RNAs that we and others have been studying appear to be quite singletons in the kind of way that they're functioning. To address the last question from the previous talk, in classical encoding RNAs, we know structure is very important. We have a lot of evidence of specific proteins, specific complexes, recognizing structure in particular RNAs. In some cases, some RNAs uh, are preserving the same structure across di di distal uh, evolutionary regimes and so on. And there is good reasons, again, to be optimistic and to think that this is important in link RNAs as well. But again, if we look at the evidence so far in the decade that link RNAs have been studied, and if we look at conservation of structure in link RNAs, there is very, very limited evidence that structure is actually important. Importantly, these RNAs are structured. If you take a random RNA, you throw it into cells or you throw it into solution, it's going to form a structure. If the RNA is GC-rich, it's going to form a stable structure. But if we look at link RNAs from different species, or we look at, a, at the few cases where we actually have some understanding on the, on the sort of base or regional level, we don't really see so far a, a lot of evidence, with few exceptions, where structure is really important. And as I already mentioned, <coughs> whereas many classical non-coding RNAs are highly conserved, in some cases even from prokaryotes to eukaryotes, link RNAs tend to evolve rapidly. And I'll talk a bit about that uh, next. So uh, my lab, as mostly other labs, have done a lot of global studies looking at uh, transcription genome-wide and annotating and defining link RNAs. And what we know today is that there are many link RNA genes. So in terms of genes, they're producing these sort of fold 2 products which are typically spliced and relatively detectable in regular uh, poly A plus RNA seq expression data. We know that there are more of these than protein coding genes. Their number grows as sequencing will become deeper. It will keep growing, but most of the things that are added to these catalogs are not as abundant. They're somewhat shorter than mRNAs, so they're about 1 kb in length on average, and typically spend two or three exons, which is much fewer than a typical mRNA, which will, on average will have seven or eight exons. And we know that many of them are lowly expressed. Again, about an order of magnitude lower than a typical mRNA. There are some exceptions that are very abundant. And in contrast to mRNAs, they're going to be much more tissue specific. 
So in terms of sort of regular kind of rule of thumb numbers, there are 20,000, maybe 18,000 protein coding genes. If you take a tissue or a cell type, it's typically going to express about half of them. So about nine to 10,000 different proteins are expressed in any given tissue cell type. In terms of link RNAs, again, more than 20,000 genes, but if you look at any particular cell type, it typically expresses kind of at one copy per cell or maybe a little bit less, about 1,000 different link RNAs, so only about 5% of what is annotated, and that's because, again, with some exceptions, many link RNAs are very tissue-specific. Their stability varies quite widely as their expression levels vary, so there are some, there is a subset of, again, about 1,000, which is relatively stable, as stable as a typical mRNA, and then there is a long tail of RNAs that are gradually becoming very, very unstable and <coughs> much less highly expressed. In terms of splicing efficiency, it is similar. Some are as efficient to splice as mRNAs, and then many not so much. And uh, there's been increasing interest in these RNAs. This is PubMed abstracts. And today, they have been implicated in a variety of various uh, different uh, pathways and biological processes with varying degrees of strength of the evidence for their involvement. What my lab and others have done a lot is also try to compare link RNAs from different species. As was already mentioned here, they turn over in evolution much more rapidly. That means that the majority of the link RNAs we have in the human genome, some of them are maybe found in other primates, but are typically not found in other mammals, not found in other species at all. We don't have today any link RNAs which are conserved between vertebrates and invertebrates. So there are link RNAs in Drosophila, in C. elegans, in yeast, and so on. But we don't have any examples of a link RNA which is the same one, or sort of at least even functionally equivalent, between a vertebrate and an invertebrate. We have about 100 which are conserved between fish and mammals. We have about 1,000 which are conserved within mammals. And these are the ones we think are most likely to be functionally important. And if we look at the way that these RNAs are, are evolving by performing RNA-seq and comparing different species, we can roughly divide them into these uh, classes where there is a small subset where we can see really conservation throughout the RNA, that many different parts of the RNA are conserved, and this resembles to us to some extreme, like ribosomal RNA. We think that these are RNAs which might really function as kind of a scaffold where different other partners, such as proteins, are going to come together, and this is going to, all going to fold and act as a particular machine. But these cases are really rare. Nora, that I might talk about towards the end today, is, is one such example. There exists would be another example. But these cases are relatively rare. They also tend to be the RNAs which are more broadly and more highly expressed. The more common case, and these together come up to around 1,000 link RNAs in mammals, are cases where there is one region which has some sequence conservation, but then the rest of the RNA sequence evolves quite rapidly. So it is acquiring new axons, it's losing axons, and so on. So in these cases, it's possible that structure is still somehow preserved, but I'm personally quite skeptical about it. It's more likely that these RNAs, in many cases, are going to act in cis in the context of the region of the chromatin where they're produced. And there, maybe, it doesn't really matter what kind of sequence they have beyond a particular region where that region might be recruiting some factor. But in many cases, this region might be concerned for other reasons, which makes it more difficult. So these tend to be still quite, uh, quite abundant and still don't overlap that much trans with the transposable elements and so on. And then again, there is a long tail of RNAs that are poorly conserved. These tend to be further away from other genes in the genome. They tend to overlap more transposable elements, and they tend to be expressed in a more tissue-specific manner. And for these, of course, it uh, is more a matter of sort of optimism or skepticism, how many of these you think are functional. I'm, I'm quite skeptical in this case. If you look at where these RNAs, the ones that are conserved, where they're found in the genome, we see that they're found throughout the genome, but many of them are enriched around genes that are themselves involved in transcription. So some of these are transcription factors, developmental transcription factors, for example, but others are, are, are genes that are involved in other parts of transcriptional process, such as chromatin modifiers. And the first story I'd like to tell today, it was recently published, is about one such case of a conserved link RNA which is associated with one of these transcription-associated genes. And we were interested in this RNA because it's relatively very highly conserved. So some time ago, we're together with Elena Shkumatova here in the audience. We looked at link RNAs in zebrafish, and we saw there was a small subset of things that are conserved throughout vertebrates. This was one of these RNAs, and we decided to focus it in, in my own lab. So if you look at it in the human genome all the way to the zebrafish genome, it is produced in the same place, which is immediately upstream of a gene called CG2, which is a chromatin modifier. I'll talk a bit about next. And this RNA has five axons in human. It has five axons in zebrafish. And again, it's always found with a short intergenic region, about 2 kb upstream of CH2 in human, about 700 bases upstream of it in zebrafish. And as far as link RNAs goes, this is more or less as, as conserved as, a, as it gets. And if we zoom in, it has a single promoter, a single poly A site, or a relatively efficient poly A site, about 2 kb. <coughs> 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 Sorry. 
upstream of CG2, and its sequence, if you look at the sequence conservation, is also quite well conserved. So what is CHD2? It's a chromatin modifier coming from the CHD family, which has about 12 other members. As chromatin modifiers go, it's a, it's a protein that eats ATP and moves nucleosomes around. That's more or less what chromatin modifier uh, means, as I learned. It has been implicated in a variety of different processes, including a uh, deposition of an unstable variant of histone 3, response to DNA damage. There are some reports of it implicated in, um, in development. It's interesting, and I'll come back to it, because haploinsufficiency, so loss of a single copy, is uh, sufficient to cause uh, epilepsy and autism in humans, quite a rare form of epilepsy, but quite a highly, highly penetrant one. It, I should also say that it is also uh, mutated in CLL. This is the only thing I'm going to say about cancer in my talk, unfortunately. And we also know that uh, knockout mice, which completely lack CG2, do not have an overt uh, phenotype. So there were some earlier reports from, based on gene traps suggesting that this gene, that knockout is embryonic lethal. But more recent knockouts, including ones that, uh, that we have made, these mice without CG2, they appear to live quite fine. So what we decided to do is to generate a mouse knockout for CG2, where we used CRISPR to excise the, so, sorry, for, for uh, the link RNA found upstream with, which we named Chaser. And we used CRISPR to excise the promoter of chaser, so we're removing about 1 kb from the mouse genome with the promoter, and we got several different alleles. And we were very uh, interested to see that we are not able to get any homozygous animals. So, uh, chaser, is so chaser knockouts are embryonic lethal postnatally. We are able to recover embryos up to day 18 and a half, but uh, postnatally uh, these are dying. And if we look at heterozygous animals, we're also seeing that we get consistently less than the 50% that we expect in these different crosses, suggesting that even heterozygous animals, in many cases, are not surviving post-birth. Uh, post if we look at the animals that are surviving, they have a severe growth retardation, and if we look at pathology, they have a variety of sort of variable penetrance uh, uh, developmental defects. Their timus, in many cases, is poorly developed, and so on. And again, but the most, pr most prominent feature they have is this uh, uh, really quite, quite, quite drastic reduction in size, there is also occasional malocclusion and so on. So in contrast to the loss of CG2, which does not cause any overt phenotypes, loss of this link RNA appears to cause a very severe phenotype, about as severe phenotype uh, for link RNA knockout as, as observed to date. So what is causing this phenotype? So if we look at the expression of uh, uh, both genome-wide and specifically at the expression of CG2, what we're seeing consistently is that loss of a single copy of a chaser causes an increase in the expression level of CG2, which we can see in the, uh, in the mouse embryos, and we can see it on the RNA level. And surprisingly, whereas on the RNA level, we typically see an increase, which is about 60%, sometimes twofold. On the protein level, in some cases, but not others, we see a much more drastic increase. So we see it in the embryos, we see a tenfold increase in the levels of the protein. We spend a lot of time trying to understand this discrepancy, and we don't know what causes it. Why, in some cases, on the protein level, we see this sort of much more drastic increase. But nevertheless, both in embryonic tissues and in the adult tissue, we always see an increase on the RNA level in the expression of, of uh, CG2, and we always see an increase in, uh, in protein expression levels. And again, in adult tissues, it's more similar what we see on the RNA and on the protein. <coughs> We're next interested to see whether this is really the function of the RNA. Maybe we remove the promoter, so this causes some promoter competition and so on. So here we turn to mouse embryonic stem cells where we could generate a deletion of the promoter of chaser, and this leads to an increase in the expression of CG2, deletion of the gene body of chaser, which doesn't touch the promoter, and we uh, tested by a 4C analysis that this does not change the chromatin contacts in the region, is still causing a similar increase in CG2 levels, suggesting it's not just a matter of promoter competition. If we differentiate the mouse embryonic stem cells into neurons, we still see this increase in CG2, and this system, we try to see whether if we now provide chaser RNA exogenously, so we introduce a lentivirus, which would express chaser from a different place in the mouse genome, whether that can rescue and reduce the levels of CAG2, and it does not. It does not have any effect, suggesting that a chaser indeed acts in cysts, and I'll show further evidence for that next. And finally, if we use antisense oligos to knock down the RNA levels of chaser, and this might affect its transcription as well, but it's primarily affecting the RNA levels, we also see this effect. And we see, see this in uh, MEFs, in N2A cells, in mouse, we also see it in human cells, suggesting that likely the RNA product, or at least the act of transcription, in this case are important, not just the, the DNA of uh, the chaser locus. So then, do we, how do we know this really acts in cysts? So here we could use the fact that we also, uh, it's a bit difficult to see here, <coughs> that we also generated a, a knockout for CG2 itself, and we did this with a single guide RNA, 
And as a result, we could, and these mice are, are viable and fertile, so we could cross these mice that are homozygous and knockout for CG2 with our heterozygous knockouts for chaser, and then use a little specific PCR to see which allele is affected. Is the allele which is affected the one next to the chaser deletion or the other one? And what we could see, again, consistently in various tissues is that we're specifically affecting the expression of the CG2 allele, which is found on the same chromosome where chaser is missing. On the other chromosome, we actually see some repression, and I'll go back to that in a couple of slides. So we see an, an increase in CG2 when chaser is missing, and the next thing we wondered whether we can actually now rescue the phenotype by getting rid of CG2, because loss of CG2 itself, again, is not very deleterious. What's very deleterious is loss of chaser, so we use the same approach for CRISPR deletion to knock out chaser, but in this case, in the background of mice, which do not produce uh, almost any CG2 protein. And uh, we were very excited to see that in this case, the mice were completely fine. So they don't have chaser anymore, but they also don't have CAG2. And now there are born Mendelian ratios, we can get knockouts, there is the, we don't see any growth retardation, and so on, suggesting that the knockout of chaser is the main phenotype we're seeing, at least, is really tunneled through this increase in the expression of CAG2. And again, these mice now look completely fine. So then, next thing that we wonder, of course, was okay, so what, what's actually happening? Why is this increase in CAG2, why is it so toxic? And we spent a lot of time looking at RNA-seq data from heterozygous animals, and we really didn't see much. We saw CAG2 is very consistently upregulated, that's very nice, but not much else is changing. And we really got a breakthrough, then we realized we can actually isolate homozygous knockout embryos, because they don't get born, but in the embryo we can get the, the knockouts. And uh, eventually we also managed to get uh, MEFs from these homozygous knockouts. And there we did see that there are some genes which are significantly changing in expression, and when we looked in the genome browser at these genes, what we saw was in many cases the genes which are affected, like DAPK3 here, are found immediately downstream of another gene which is typically very highly expressed. So this is one example here, again, reduction in the gene which is downstream of another gene which is highly expressed. This is another gene also reduced significantly. And again, it has a close upstream neighbor which is more, much more abundantly expressed. And to us, this immediately kind of suggests that this is something similar to what happens at the CG2 locus itself. Of course, first look systematically whether these are just examples or whether this is a global phenomenon. Indeed, this was a global phenomenon. We could see that the reduction in expression in the chaser knockout MEFs was associated with close distance to the closest upstream uh, tandem neighbor. <coughs> 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 Sorry. Uh, so uh, there is a reduction if you have a close upstream neighbor. There is a further reduction if your close upstream neighbor is highly expressed, like in the examples we saw before. If you look as a control at other cases where there is a tandem neighbor, but that neighbor is expressed divergently, we don't see any change. So with this reduction only happens if you have an upstream neighbor which is highly expressed. And again, as a control, if we now look at our double knockout mice which don't have chaser but also don't have CAG2, this effect completely disappears, suggesting that this transcriptional interference is driven by access levels of CAG2 in the chaser knockout mice. So is CG2 read? So this suggests that CG2 is active in these intergenic regions. So the next thing we wondered is the protein actually found to go there in regular cells? And here we could use published ChIP-seq data for CG2. And indeed, we saw that in particularly in the highly expressed genes, there is indeed a peak of its occupancy in the window of about 2 kb downstream of transcription termination sites. Which and this 2 kb is about the size of the window where we really see an effect. So this suggests that in regular conditions, CG2 protein is indeed found in these regions downstream of transcription termination sites, and now we think that once chaser is gone and there is this excess production of the protein, more of it is going to these intergenic regions, causing transcriptional interference and resulting in downregulation of a gene, if a gene such a, such a gene is found, downstream of these transcription termination sites. So we also wondered whether CG2 also binds RNA. It has been associated, reported as one of these non-canonical RNA binding proteins in a variety of studies that used oligo-DT to pull down on polyadenylated RNA, and then proteomics to identify the associated proteins. So we used RIP to see which kinds of RNAs are bound by CG2. And it was interesting that we found that there is indeed a subset which is significantly bound by CG2, and these genes tend to be regulated when the protein is knocked out or when chaser is knocked out and so the protein is overproduced. So the RNAs which are bound by CG2 appear to be downregulated when it is mutated, and they appear to be upregulated when um, there is access of the protein. And chaser itself is also one of the most significantly enriched RNAs 
among the RNAs are bound by CG2, suggesting that, it, that part of the functionality, and I should emphasize, we don't really know how Chaser is functioning. We think that part of the function is because it is bound by CG2 protein itself. So this is our model currently. So in regular conditions, we have production of CG2, and it, it is going, uh, one of the regions where the protein is going is downstream transcription termination sites, including downstream transcription termination sites of Chaser, where together with the RNA product of Chaser, this combination is repressing the CG2 promoter. Then, when Chaser is missing, either because of, of noise or maybe because of different conditions which are inducing the expression of CG2, there is overproduction of the protein. There is overproduction because the protein can now no longer go on and feed back on its own expression because Chaser is not produced. In the uh, uh, heterozygous uh, um, scenario where we have chaser on one allele or don't have chaser, but don't have chaser on the other allele, what we think is happening is that there is this overproduction and this overproduction on the allele where chaser is produced is leading, is leading to overrepression. That's why in these sort of cross animals that we had, we saw an increase in the expression of CG2 on the allele where chaser is missing, but then some decrease on the other allele. So I think that in this case, this RNA, and we think this, this is more general because there are many other link RNAs found in proximity to promoters of other chromatin modifiers, but they're probably going to act in a different way. But we do think that this could be a common thing where link RNA production in proximity to promoters of genes involved in chromatin regulation is going to, are going to be part of feedback loops where these chromatin modifiers are going to use RNA to uh, regulate uh, their own uh, promoters. Uh, importantly, this is conserved in human cells. In human cells, if we knock down chaser, this leads to an increase in the expression of CAG2. This is potentially clinically relevant because uh, I want to remind you that haploinsufficiency or heterozygous mutations in CAG2 cause epilepsy and autism. And here, at least theoretically, we have a means to increase expression of CAG2 in these individuals by knocking down the expression of chaser. And this is something that we're now uh, testing further. So the next thing which we'd like to do is, of course, to understand the mechanism for which chaser is acting or other link RNAs are acting. And one thing we could do is try to take the whole RNA, it's about 1 kb, and to identify all the proteins associated with it. But as we've done, and other, many of you in the audience probably did this experiment in the past, that, that's quite challenging because you're going to get more or less the whole mouse proteome or the whole human proteome associated with an RNA which is 1 kb in length. So what we'd like to do is to now somehow narrow down and figure out which regions are actually functionally important. And the way to do that would be, in many cases, to use comparative genomics. And here, in principle, we, we, we are really well positioned to do that because we have an RNA which is very highly conserved. Again, it's conserved all the way from human to zebrafish. Its uh, exon intron structure is, is quite well conserved. So what we'd like to do is now to ask, okay, what about chaser is actually conserved? And the, the classical way to do it would do to, to take the sequences and to do blast one against the other. But this also introduces the, the challenge here if we take the human uh, um, chaser versus the mouse chaser and blast them, we see quite a lot of similarities, quite highly conserved, more or less the whole sequence seems to align. So it's not really helpful for us to narrow down in a region which is particularly important. In contrast, if we take human against zebrafish and blast them against each other, there is no sequence homology. And this is because blast, sort of similarity with blast, to be significant, you typically need to have about 20 bases which are almost perfectly identical. And this, uh, in the case of Chaser, in the case of many other link RNAs, this just doesn't happen. Not because blast is not a good tool, just because they will share only shorter sequences, and these sequences are just not statistically significant. It's not surprising that there is a seven mer shared between two sequences which are 1 kb uh, in length. So one alternative which one could do is one could look at a multiple sequence alignment. This went horribly wrong. Okay, so rotate it in, in your mind, but the message goes through nevertheless. And what the message here is that, yeah, you can do a multiple sequence alignment. You'll get a, multiple, a, a long, very long multiple sequence alignment. But to go from that into specific regions which are important is quite difficult because it's, uh, this alignment spans, I think, uh, seven PDF pages. Again, within it, there are some regions which appear to be more conserved, others maybe not so conserved, but still this doesn't really give us a particular uh, uh, hotspots of conservation, which is what we're interested in to try and go after uh, sort of potential protein binding partners and so on. So with this in mind, and because we saw this in many other RNAs as well, we decided that we need a different approach. And, and the, what the assumption, so obviously to, to get at anywhere, we need to make some, some additional assumptions. And the assumption which we decided to map, make is what we're looking for are a combination of short sequence elements, which are by themselves not necessarily going to be significant, but what is going to be significant is a combination of uh, consecutive uh, short sequence elements which are present 
in the uh, different uh, link RNA sequences from different species. So our input here, okay, I'm finished. So our input in this case are sequences of the same link RNA from different species, and what we're looking for are a combination of short sequence motifs which are found in the same order in these uh, uh, the different species. Again, this is a limiting assumption, but we have to make some assumption to, to move forward. <coughs> <coughs> so what we're looking for, so the way that we're, going, we're, we're solving this, and this is a part of a framework that Caroline in my lab uh, developed, which is called link Loom, is that we're representing each sequence as a, a combination of nodes in a network, where every short k-mer is now a node, and what we're looking for are these paths which are connecting different uh, species so this conserved combination of k-mers is going to correspond to a combination of paths in the network. And the constraint that we are using, the constraint of order, is basically telling us that these paths within the network, they shouldn't intersect with one another. So in reality, this is complicated because the, every k-mer is going to appear in many different places. So the network is quite, is quite convoluted. And from this network, we'd now like to find this combination of non-intersecting elements. But luckily, we can use some, uh, some computational uh, ideas for doing it. So one, one way that we can simplify the solution a little bit is that we can use BLAST. So again, BLAST for human versus zebrafish doesn't find anything. But BLAST for human against mouse does find specific regions which are corresponding. So we could limit the network to only consider regions which are within these highly scoring pairs identified by BLAST. And then we can transform this network problem into a mathematical problem where basically we assign every edge with a, we can assign every edge with a one or a zero, and we want to maximize the number of ones we're taking. We want to maximize the number of paths that we're identifying, subject to constraints that once we uh, uh, select uh, this edge, we can now no longer select this edge or this edge, and so on. So again, this is sort of a toy example, but we can generalize this, and there are some very efficient tools so in so-called integer linear programming, so a computational approach which allows us to solve this problem quite efficiently on, uh, as long as the number of edges we have is up to sort of, uh, maybe 20,000 edges. Uh, so the solutions uh, look like this. The solutions look, this is now chaser and human, mouse, uh, lizard, and zebrafish, and we, and we can identify specific k which are shared between the different sequences. In this case, we identify specific sequences which are conserved all the way to zebrafish. And we can assign these with significance because we can take the individual sequences in, in, in these chase sequences from different species, align them, shuffle the alignment, then repeat the algorithm on these shuffled inputs, which eventually gives us a p-value for what's the probability that we find a particular sixmer, even though it's, again, it's not going to be significant if we just compare two species, but we can find significant things uh, once we uh, consider the fact that we are aligning many uh, sequences from different species. And um, we can also then annotate the specific cameras we find. We use both uh, microRNA target site predictions and eclipse data where available to assign individual cameras that we found with functional information as, uh, as much as we can. And we uh, report this as well as reporting specific modules, specific combination of cameras which appear uh, to be similar to each other in different, close to each other in different species. Uh, so these are all reported as kind of part of the reach output of this. So if we go back to Chaser, what did we find? So we found that there, there are very specific short motifs which are conserved towards the beginning of the last exon. And when we look at these short motifs, what thing that makes this exciting is that they're similar to each other. So there's this G-A-T-G core, which we can store a purine, then N-A-T-G, then typically another G. We can see it here, we can see it here. And if we look at additional sequences around, there appears to be several uh, additional places where related cameras are found. This, of course, looks kind of like a translation initiation signal, which has, seems to have nothing to do with this nuclearly enriched RNA. Again, this is on the last exon. But what we, we, we are starting to do now is we generated the sequence of this region, uh, the wild type sequence, we generated a sequence where we mutated specifically these conserved motifs, and then we are, trans we are transcribing these in vitro into bitonylated RNA and then using these as baits for pull down to identify the proteins which are associated with it. So we think that there are specific factors that are presumably binding to these conserved motifs, and now we have a way to, to testing them because now we don't just do proteomics on a 1KB RNA versus scrambled controls. We can take two specific RNAs with very specific defined differences to identify proteins that are specifically binding to these conserved regions. Um, so here are some examples of what this looks like for other RNAs. So this is serenoin RNA. We worked with also with uh, uh, Lena quite some time ago. So this is an RNA which is known to bind MIR7 through a very extensively complementary site. And if we apply this approach, we identify <coughs> 
several additional elements, including an additional microRNA binding site, a very short open reading frame found at the very uh, beginning, as well as binding sites from some additional uh, RNA binding proteins which have been validated to bind this RNA. And this is uh, another example of uh, an RNA that uh, Lena's group has studied. This one is known to have a, a binding site for MIR-29, also a very extensively complementary one. But if we look at the conserved elements, in this case between zebrafish and, uh, and human, we see actually in several additional microRNA binding sites. These are uh, um, not as complementary, so we don't think they act on the microRNA as, uh, as it acts on MIR-29. We think these are more likely to regulate the RNA itself, but it's very uh, uh, nice to see here that specific conserved elements which we find exactly correspond to the 7 mer or 8 mer seed matches of these specific RNAs. And uh, with this, I'll uh, sort of uh, finish this part. So we have a new framework, and if you're interested in trying it, you, you're welcome to, to contact us, which allows us to identify combination of short conserved sequence elements in deeply conserved RNAs. And we think that this is a, can be a very useful gateway in towards zooming in within these RNA sequences on specific short elements, which are likely to be uh, functionally important. And of course, there are several, sort of many other directions that we would like to take this uh, next. And I'm going to skip this part, but you can talk to me about it. Five I said five, well, five minutes, I think I'll, I'll uh, still skip it. And um, I'll devote it to questions instead. So uh, these are the people who did work. So the first part was uh, made done by Aviv, a PhD student in the lab. And uh, Link Loom was developed by Caroline. And we're always looking for more people. And I'll be happy to take questions.